What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Hot Geek News, a podcast that talks about comic books, movies, TV shows. Typically, yes, we are drinking a nice beer on the show. However, today we are not. It is the middle of the afternoon. We have kids to pick up from school. Come on, we are sometimes responsible adult human beings, very rarely. And uh, without too much further ado, man, we got a really good episode for you guys as Jacob Phillips and Chris Condon are coming to join us to talk about the Enfield Gang Massacre from Image Comics. A fantastic, if you're like me, who grew up sitting with my grandfather wa- uh, watching Westerns, man, like the good old Westerns, the Clint Eastwood days, the John Wayne days. This is a this is a six issue arc that really takes you back to those those good old times. And uh, maybe you're just on the fence about Westerns. And to me, I think Westerns are going to be coming back. So before we get there, though, go ahead, subscribe, all that good stuff. Hops Geek News is where you can find us, all your favorite pa- podcasting platforms, social media. I'm the one that mainly runs Twitter. Lauren runs Instagram. And then uh, we kind of dual hat the rest of the things. So find us on YouTube. And uh, we have two episodes weekly. And so Lauren, welcome, welcome. And everybody... What is up, Lauren? You're just drinking water, right? Any coffee? Anything exciting? No, I had, there's lemon in my water, organic lemon. Oh, is it organic lemon? lemon not from butter. Waffle House this time? Nope, not from Waffle House. They don't have organic that's, lemons. We learned that the hard shame. way a while ago. That's okay. I found out the hard way that Dunkin' Donuts likes to put hair in bagels. So you know what? We all have our things. <laughs> I think you should have already known that, though. <laughs> we did. I did. I was. I will never get over me just trashing Dunkin' Donuts as we're pulling in, and then lo and behold, there was a hair in my bagel. But you know what? Like that it's, it's not wasn't an accident. They like to put hair. <laughs> well, you know, uh, everybody always asks me like, "What is your obsession with Dunkin' Donuts?" And I'm like, "Guys, I am just a man from Boston, Massachusetts. That when you're born, they baptize you with the rivers of the Charles River, and they also like throw an iced Dunkin' Donuts coffee in your hands, and that's what you survive off of for the first year of your life." And I don't know what it is. It's Stockholm syndrome, man. I think there's and some childhood trauma in there. He thinks he deserves it. Should go to therapy. Should really go to therapy. <laughs> I but I mean, it's, it's uh, it is what it is. It's you know? it's not great, but you know what? There's something about it. And uh, that voice you hear right there is our friend Chris. Welcome to the show. Let's introduce you first, man. How are you doing? And uh, let's give the the folks a little bit of background into yourself. Uh, well, I apologize for jumping the gun. No, <laughs> oh, you're good, good. Uh, dude. You are good. Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Chris Condon. I'm the writer of the Enfield Gang Massacre, that Texas Blood, and a few other things. Um, I do that. I, <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah. I, I I wrote a thing called Hell's a Squared Circle. I have an upcoming uh, adaptation of of uh, Barry Gifford's novel Night People from Oni Press, and I'm doing some EC comic stories as well for them. Um, yeah, and then some stuff I can't talk about yet, but, you know, there's more stuff in the future. That's and right. My story. I love NDAs, man. NDAs are always fun because it's builds the anticipation up for, for everybody. It's like, I got these things I can't talk about, but there are things. You just wait. There are things. <laughs> there are certainly things. Yeah. And uh, Jacob, welcome to the show yourself. Uh, how's it going? And a little bit about you. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you for having us on. Um, yeah. I draw some of the things that Chris writes. Uh, Enfield Gang Massacre, Texas Blood. Um I'm currently working on Megalopolis, a uh, graphic novel adaptation of the upcoming Francis Ford Coppola movie, um, amongst yeah other things that can't be discussed. So it's just yeah, it's good <laughs> that you can only good. see like this wall. So there's just like all the hidden things of that way. <laughs> ah, guys, I'm staring at the coolest of things, and only I get to see them right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, but that's awesome. Thank you guys for for coming to hang out. Um, I've become familiar with your work over the last you know year or so, especially getting to check out the Enfield Gang Massacre, uh, which to me, you know, I was getting to review for Nerd Initiative, which is something we write comic book reviews every week for people out there. Check out Nerd Initiative every Tuesday and Wednesday. Soon to be only Wednesday with DC coming back to Wednesday releases. Thank God uh, at nine a.m. So from there. Let's uh let's get into your kind of comic book origin stories. What kind of got you guys into writing and drawing comic books? What brought you into like this this geek universe, so to speak? You want to go first? I can go first, sure. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I just grew up with comics everywhere, and like my dad draws comics. Um, oh. I I started going to 
shows when I was 11 years old um, and sitting with him and making my own books and printing them at home and selling them at shows uh, at my dad's table. Um, you know, I can't remember a time before I was reading comics. When my dad used to work for DC and we would, I would get the box of comps every month of everything they put out so I could just go and leaf through it and, and pick out, you know, whatever it's, whatever Batman or Teen Titans or whatever it is that I wanted to read. Um, and then, you know, I, I sort of, it was, it was always there, but it was never something I really intended on actually doing myself because I've seen how much work it is. You know, I mm. wanted to draw, but I didn't want to draw comics because comics are hard. And um, it's much easier, well, maybe not easier, but there's a lot less work in uh, doing yeah. sort of straight illustration stuff that I was doing prior to entering into the world of comics. Um, and then Chris sort of dragged me in. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been here since. Um, you know, even with Texas Blood, it was never intentionally, no, it, it wasn't originally in, intended to be a comic book. So um, mm. it was, I sort of came into it before that and then we ended up doing it as a comic book and I've been in it since. So it's been a, a, like, you know, it's, it's a lucky accident for my <laughs> career. <I think. laughs> You're in the family really, business. Yeah, that's amazing. Cause I feel like I try to get my kids to watch things and read things and they don't want to. My son's named Logan and he won't watch X-Men with me. I just, <laughs> I don't know what to do. So I love that you actually saw that and we're like, Oh, this is what my dad's doing and you love it as well. So that's, that's a really cool origin yeah. story. And one we have not had. Yeah. So and Chris, uh, what's your origin story? I was going to say, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, I just, I've always loved comics. You know, I didn't have anybody in the house that read comics or anything aside from the fun sun, Sunday funnies. But um, I just, I kind of just always, I always loved art. My uncle was an artist and I, I always kind of gravitated towards like, start probably started with the Sunday funnies. Like it was like peanuts and, and, uh, Growing up in New Jersey, we had Mutz. Uh, Mutz was a creation of the guy who's from around here. Um, we just had a, a Marvel book come out last year, I believe, or early this year. Um, but, uh, you know, I had just always gravitated towards comics and, and really kind of found them because of, you know, film and TV. There was the, the X-Men animated show and Batman the animated series and, you know, all the Batman movies in the 90s, um, Spider-Man in the early 2000s, X-Men. Um, but I, I think the actual first comic book I ever owned was because of a sort of reviled Batman film, uh, which is Batman and Robin. Uh, in 1997, they were... Dude, movie. those movies are so fucking good i love them. they aren't good oh, really? okay, okay. Well, so they're I, not good I'm but they're amazing them, but they're i think the consensus is that they're revived <laughs> they, okay so it's like dunkin donuts man it's like that's not good but i appreciate it yeah no, no no i actually i quite like batman forever batman and robin is a little tougher to go through except it does have a scene in which batman and robin fall into a vat of Mint chocolate chip ice cream. I mean, <laughs> if you do that in a movie, that's that's okay with me. The back credit cards um, and the, yeah, all the, of those things. In in 1997, at Toys R Us, they gave away. Um, if you bought something, I guess if it, if you bought something Batman uh, related, which of course that's all I cared about, um, they would give you a, a reproduction of. The, the first appearance of Poison Ivy or the first appearance of Batgirl or the first appearance of Mr. Freeze. So my first introduction into like actual, you know, a comic book was probably that. Um, Cause again, my parents did, didn't read comics. My brother didn't read comics. I was the only one who ended up reading comics. I was the one who kind of haunted the local comic book store and, you know, tried to get them to come down to $2 on, this like rare Daredevil comic and um, <laughs> and so that was, nerd. that was my life was just like buying you know going and, and doing that and I just always because of that I always was like just writing and drawing my own stuff when I was a kid and then it grew into realizing that uh, if I can get Jake to draw my comic 
uh, I think I'd be better off. So that's what I ended up doing. So that's it. You, I mean, it's not, it's no, no crazy. There's no like eureka moment. It just sort of happened. I've always been doing it. It's one of those things that, yeah, you just always kind of grew up like the both of you guys, you've been kind of around it your whole life. And so it organically happened, uh, which that's kind of the better stories, right? It's just one of those things that just feels natural. And uh, I know you, Jacob has mentioned how you dragged him into it. You even mentioned you dragged him into it. So how did this team up come about? <laughs> like, what's the origin story behind that? Well, uh, I cold emailed Jake. Uh, I found his email on DeviantArt, I believe, or one of the those sites that host artwork. And um, he had been doing the illustrations in the backups of his uh, father's book with Ed Brubaker called Killer Be Killed. Um, and I was trying to get a movie made and it's hard to get people to give you money to make a short film. So I was like, well, how can I get people to invest in this? And I was like, maybe if they could visualize the screenplay, cause it's hard to get people to actually, you know, see what you're trying to do unless you're actually showing them images. So I asked Jake if he wanted to do the concept art for it because I loved what he was doing. Um, and I thought he had a, the perfect style for a, what I was trying to do and also just, uh, in terms of concept art, he had a very kind of his, his illustration style was perfect for it. So anyway, I reached out to him just on DeviantArt and I was like, hey, I, I want to do this thing. I feel like the screenplay, maybe you'll want to do it. Um, and he said, yeah. And then just, you know, still just had no success with Yeah, we would have like, you know, I had made a short film in, I think, the previous year and made that for no money and so the idea was to try to do this for a little bit more money and try to get a name star in it try to boost our sort of stature in, in the industry and it just it was just not going for whatever reason so after a year or two of trying to get that made just got frustrated and i was already thinking about doing something else as a comic which i was actually going to draw myself <laughs> thank god i didn't <laughs> um, and I just reached out back out to Jake and I was like, you want to just do this as a comic? Because we both hadn't had anything um, comic wise. And I thought it'd be fun to just actually have this story out there and tell it. Um, and <clears throat> I do think it's fun that, you know, it wasn't, you know, we, what we did, you know, in terms of just enjoying comics our entire lives, you know, the first thing we did wasn't, you know, necessarily a comic booky idea we kind of went with something that was just, you know, a story that we wanted to tell. Mm. That's, yeah. So that's that how true. we got together. And so now, now we're we're best of okay. friends. Best, <laughs> best of friends. I can tell. He's over here like, God, I've been <laughs> stuck with this guy ever since. Why did I answer that email? We've been wearing the same. We've been wearing the same. Thing. I know. Right? Recording, you guys coordinate up? <laughs> I forgot my plan. <laughs> <laughs> now um before we go too much in because I, I immediately wanted to start asking more questions but let's actually talk a little bit about the comic we're here to talk about today is enfeld gang massacre which is a prequel to that texas blood uh so do you guys want to give us a brief summary of that before we ask our specific questions pertaining to this specific comic which just ended in january and will be in trade back very soon so give us if you were pitching this to someone who is maybe doesn't even read comic books because this is a very unique story for a comic book this is not your cliche typical superhero this is very action-filled very western very sad um very surprising twist and turn so how would you pitch this to somebody who let's say has never read a comic book and you're trying to convince them to read this um Jake, how would you pitch it? Because I know I'd pitch it poorly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, probably worse. Um, <laughs> a root in, two in bad time. <laughs> That's, well, I, <laughs> this is like a Thunder Mountain. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I think that's a good uh, a good quick pitch. <laughs> I, I think I might say that it's a. Uh, uh, action-packed dramatic western um i i'm you know i i, I think that it's uh, it explores the line between good and evil and if there is a line or if it's just a blurred line i don't know it's just you know and it's also just just a lot of action there's a lot of yeah. good good there's, good point. Good clean yeah. There's some really good, like, uh, right, right. good, like, 
speaking of the action, like a lot of the sequences, especially that Jake draws, man, it's it's it bloody. But the the color aspects that you use for some of that is just absolutely gorgeous. And uh, what made you guys settle on like a, a Western and specifically this tale? Um, because you guys do some cool things. You kind of give like backstory and like historical, almost newspaper writings before you lead into the comic and as you're exiting the comic. Yeah, that's uh, that's Jake's fault. So Jake, um, in issue seven of that Texas blood in the back matter, I referenced something called the Anfield gang massacre. And I'd say something about it happened in 1875 and blah, 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 whatever I said. I don't really remember what I said, but, uh, Jake latched onto that and was like, were we ever going to see that? And I was like, well, sure we could do that. And I, it turned into our next thing was we both were sort of, we had done three volumes of that Texas blood. And it's not that we're tired of doing that Texas blood. We like doing that Texas blood and we like the characters that we get to play with, but it's, you know, you don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again, essentially. So we were like, well, let's do this other thing and we'll take a break and, you know, we'll do this Western because we both like Westerns. We both love Western films. And, you know, we also are big fans of the comics, especially the Italian Western comics. Um, it's funny that there's spaghetti Westerns in film and then there's also, I guess, spaghetti Westerns in comics. I don't know what they yes. call them exactly. It's not just Italian Westerns, um, but like Sergio Topi and there's i mean there's a whole bunch of great western comic artists but um we just thought it'd be fun to do that um and it was really kind of jake kind of spurring me on and and kind of getting me to think about it and and you know it developed beyond whatever i had thought it was it actually had originated way 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 back in a, a pilot script that i'd written in 2013 um and that was a totally different thing but the idea of this gang called the Enfield gang and having them do, you know, having the thing called the massacre, the Enfield gang massacre really originated from then and just sort of stuck with me. And I, you know, referenced it and I, I throw out these references all the time in the back matter and like the hopes that, you know, there's like threads to pull and we can tell yeah. other stories here and there. So um, that's really, you know, where, where it came from, but I'm sure Jake also wanted to draw some horses. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, like, what's that like for you getting to play in a Western world? Because everybody has like these ideas of you know the what wild the wild, wild west. west. You know, like, Will Smith had his own idea once upon a time that looked interesting, <laughs> and we all have like these ideas of the wild west. So, what was like for you playing in this toy box? Um, it was cool. I think um, so. We, me and Chris, together visited Texas, like two years ago um and that was the first time i've been drawing the book for like three years but you know oh, texas wow. blood by for like three years by that point um and i'd never been so i'd like spent some time in towns and spent some time out in the desert and uh, you know sort of all over west texas um and it was like it like came to life and i was like taking photos and you know so a lot of the landscapes that you see in the book uh I directly referenced from photographs that I took whilst I was out there. Like some of in the uh, in the trade, we have some like design pages with photographs, and they're the photos that I took when I was out there. We we put I put together like a, a newspaper sort of zine thing, you know, big format mm -hmm. um, of some of the photos that I took when I was out there as well. So it was like I was sort of itching to draw this stuff. Like you know, there's a lot of it in Texas Blood, but you. We don't use the landscape in quite the same way in that because it's obviously a lot of it take, takes place in a town and um, it's in the modern era. So it's it was fun to be able to draw on that, you know, and the excitement that it was when I got to see it all for the first time as well. And um, and it's like yeah, it's like a sort of different world entirely, especially for me because I'm not even in the U.S. So it's like right. trust me, every yeah. time I have to go to Texas myself, I'm like, where am I at right now? Yeah. Oh it's, yeah, we did a, a road wild. trip. It's it's never ending. We drove from Florida to California, God, yeah. and Texas was like a good chunk of it. But it's it's yeah. beautiful watching the sunset, like when we're driving, yeah. and yeah, it's it's huge. 
Um, so with you guys having worked together now for a while, how's that process with the story coming on the page? Do you guys have a pretty smooth process at this point? Is it a lot of back and forth or is it just, I mean, because Jacob, your artwork is, is absolutely gorgeous and it's very unique as well. So how has that worked? Is, is this just one of those like Jacob knows what he's doing? he's got it or do you guys be like mm, well i want this a little bit more like this or this a little bit more like that to emphasize the story um i think we trust each other just to get on with it really and also uh because i am so bad at time management we don't have time for tweaks at the end particularly <laughs> so chris gets what i draw um <laughs> but no, i think yeah, i like it <laughs> jake's like i took the pictures i know what's going on here <laughs> yeah. um so it's like yeah, you know, I, Chris usually says, I've got this idea, and then gives me the first script, and I start drawing it. And I don't know how it's going to end until it ends. Um, you know, Chris doesn't really give, you know, I have a general idea of what's going on, but I don't know what's going to happen at the end. And so I'm reading it as if I am a reader myself, mm -hmm. which is exciting. It keeps it fun for me. Um, not just like, oh, I've got you know 200 pages to draw. I know it's going to end up here. Now I need to start, you know, and it's like going up that hill. Whereas mm. this feels a lot more like, oh, you know, 20 pages, well, more like 27, 28 pages at a time. And being like, oh, cool, like this is what I get to draw this month. And I, you know, get off and do it. And, um, but yeah, I normally get a pretty finished script. Um, most yeah in like one chunk and then i go up and draw it and i send chris pages sort of every few days whenever i've drawn some pages um and he usually goes cool and then we do you know we move on yeah. so it's just... well you know i i i think that there's you know he was saying that there's not a lot of time for stuff and like that's sometimes true but i also generally don't have any nitpicky sort of anything because I I like what he does mm -hmm. and I think that's worked out for the both of us that we both like what we do individually so it works out that we get to do it you know we go, both get to add our own things to it and you know that's what makes our collaboration work um, but like you know I mean we've done more work outside of just that Texas blood and like we we both just got an email yesterday with like a bunch of notes on a thing that we're doing and it's just, it's funny to me because I'm like looking at it and I'm like, I wouldn't have had any of these. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, it's, it's, it's good to have that sort of that, that balance. But I, I also, I, I generally just like what he does. And um, unless there's anything, something like drastic, like, oh, this needs to be here because story wise, that should be there, you know. But I mean, that rarely happens. Um, we're all telling, you know, oh, we need this, we need that. Cause I, I just, I, I think that one of the great things about being a comic writer is getting comic art into your mailbox, you know, and mm -hmm. it's just fun to look at it and go, Ooh, I wrote that. And now it's there. <laughs> you know? um, it's just a really cool thing. And then to see it inked and colored and all that, it's just, it's a, it's one of the great joys. So I, I don't really, I don't really think I'd get much enjoyment out of nitpicking anybody. Um, I, I just, you know, the process is just fun i mean and i've been really fortunate that i've been able to work with people like jake that i just like like their stuff and i get along with them and that's i'm happy just to do that you know yeah it i think as well because we don't have we don't have an editor like on the book because we're with image you know they they edit in terms of you know they read through it and tell us when we've got a spelling mistake or whatever but it's creatively it's all done to us and it's only the two of us you know and yeah, there's yeah. no there's no lesser there's no colorist there's no, none of that so i think it's quite it's like the most straightforward it could possibly be like chris writes right. it gives it to me i draw it and we send it to image and it's like it when we have worked with editors and stuff it's just like you know i appreciate you know the input and they can help sometimes but like really helpful and we'll see things that i wouldn't have seen or something like that but a lot of the time, it's like, I wish I was just sort of left alone to do it. But I think we've been spoiled by working with Image. Like, you know, first book is with Image, and, and you know, it's sort of the best you can get in terms of that 
uh, yeah. kind of situation. So it's like, yeah, we've definitely been spoiled in that regard. Well, and you're playing in a world you created, so you don't have the rules of DC or yeah. Marvel or, or anything. So that's got to be very freeing. Yeah. yeah. Although when we did do a DC story, DC basically left us alone. Yeah, that's which true. Was great. Uh, we did the we did a Harley Quinn short story, and uh, Matthew Levine, our editor, basically. I mean, we we basically they it's an out of continuity, so we were allowed to do whatever we wanted, um, mm. and so that you know, so we've been fortunate in that way too. Is that we've done sort of when we have done a big two thing. It happened to be that we were able to just, you know, run away on. I, I'm, you know, I believe that we got some notes here and there on, on some of yeah. this, but the, there were more, you know, green. Right. right. No, that definitely makes a lot of sense. And kind of going back to these characters, I think what you guys did something really interesting with these characters is now it's very easy in a book that's about a gang to write them as the villain of the story. But that's not necessarily the case. I mean, it's things aren't as black and white in this book. And if I walked away personally, like the the cops and especially the Suedo sheriff that took over, uh, not necessarily the good guys of the the situation. So, what was that like for you deciding how to frame this story as what you wanted readers to take away from it? Whether it's the good guys, the bad guys, or like the overall message of the story. Yeah. Um... I just, I mean, we, we, that Texas blood is about a sheriff and the sheriff's office. So we're, we're generally, we're focused on like the good guys, the sheriff, you know, the sheriff, like the, the cops are the good guys. Um, and in refocusing for, for Enfield, one of the things that I kind of, and going back to that original pilot that I talked about, I mean, in that Enfield was a bad guy and he it, there was no bones about it. I mean, it, it started off with like a stagecoach that gets robbed, and but it, he was just like brutal and mean, and it became like a big standoff between him and like the sheriff's office or whatever. I don't really remember the details of it, but he was the bad guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but in you know, in my education on Texas and Texas history, um, and it comes down to stuff as popular as like the Alamo. A lot of what you hear is not necessarily the truth. Um, and I mean, that's that's definitely, that's the case throughout history. You know, history is written by the victors, that, yeah. you know, that cliche, but it's, it, in Texas, there's there's this, it, the Texas Rangers were, were a big part of what I wanted to do because they, they, they've so whitewashed their history. Oh, and yeah. we're trying to make them into, into the good guys when the history is actually very, muddy and dark and bordering on villainous um and so i wanted to tell a story in which this gang who are outlaws and they're they're definitely you know they're definitely doing that stuff that's outside the law but the the reaction to them is is so just out of the ordinary and just it, you know i really wanted to just hit home that that, that there were people that that you know, this sort of whatever we consider frontier justice um, was barbaric, uh, just as barbaric as, you know, what they considered, you know, barbarous. Yeah. So that was, oh, I, I enjoyed the castration of the wife beater, though, and you call in that frontier justice. <laughs> I giggled um, at that part. <laughs> well, it, yeah, so I, that's just something I wanted to play with, and, and it was, you know, just looking at the, the history and the rewriting of history and uh, that whole thing uh especially in, te in texas history and is that what led you to kind of put that into the actual comic book seeing that the history is not as it seems because that was a big part of the storytelling in this and part of what made it such an amazing story yeah i mean it was that was definitely part of it it was also the other part of it was also that we had a very short amount of pages to tell a <laughs> lot of story and, and we were you know, we were constricted to, we, we gave ourselves the three panel page and, and splash page rule, um, which is the Darwin Cook rule kind of from uh, New Frontier. So we kind of constricted ourselves in that way. Um, and so I, there's not a lot of real estate to tell a story, but I mean, that, that did allow me, that, that did force me to kind of, you know, stretch certain 
new muscles and, and figure out a new way to, to tell a story in, in a short amount of pages. But it also, in having that back matter to explore that, it allowed me space to, to further tell the story, which is why we're also including that back matter in, um, in the trade. Um, it's because I felt like it became integral to the story, whereas mm, the back oh, we typically used in that Texas blood is ancillary. It's not necessarily mm. necessary to read. Part of it. Okay. Um, it helps, but it does, it's not necessary. Whereas with this, I felt like it was more necessary, and it, it really did help to to flesh out character and motives and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I it, it that definitely played a role. I, I the first article that I wrote was pretty lengthy and I really did want to set out to, to do that. I didn't necessarily know that we were going to be telling this huge sprawling story in the back matter, but it, it was definitely a part of what I wanted to do. And now on the opposite end of that kind of talking about, I mentioned this is a bloody, bloody story and it's like not always black or white. So Jake, what was it like for you? Was there any moment where you're like, did you just automatically, yeah, dude, we're in a shootout. We need to make this like, this has to do its thing. What was it like for you creating some of these like pretty, pretty graphic scenes? Um, yeah, it's, I think, I think it's definitely the most gory stuff that we've done. Um, a, a lot of the time what we do is sort of like the, sort of the violence is sort of off panel. Whereas here we sort of didn't shy away from it nearly as much. Um, and it's good fun, but I don't think it's like, I don't think it's gratuitous. I think it's sort of like, it's- Well, it serves the story. It's necessary. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there, there wasn't any like, oh, we're just gonna do this. It's, it's not like the boys, fun. which yeah, I love. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's good um, for that. And yeah, and I think, I'm hope, I hope each sort of death packs the punch it was intended to have. Because it's you know obviously we're picking off members of the gang through the se series, um, and yeah, that sort of you want that to take an emotional toll rather than just be like, oh, that's cool, like look how much you know, look at his head explode, um, <laughs> which you know does happen. Um, but no, it's, it's good fun, I think, it, and it's the most sort of action packed thing that we've done, and that's yeah, it's a new muscle to stretch. Um, I think like I I think that I excel at the quiet sort of human aspects of storytelling. So it was good fun to practice doing this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um which isn't necessarily what I consider my strong suit, but I think yeah, you know, I think I did an okay job of it. But it's um I would say you did. Anyway. Um, you did some really cool things with like the colors too. I mean, especially when you were showing some of these deaths there was a lot of like dark blues and kind yeah. of like purples and things like that. What went into choosing how to color these things? Well, it's the same way I approach when I'm coloring anything. You know, I color my, my dad's stuff as well. And it's with something like when I'm doing someone else's work, it's even more, probably even more at the forefront of my mind is the storytelling aspect of the colors. Um, you know, I think you can sort of forget that that's part of the storytelling toolkit um which i try not to do i try and keep it there even though a lot of this series is sort of like bright uh vibrant colors which sort of goes against what you see in a lot of western comics There's a lot of yeah. times it's sort of that muted sepia tone kind of thing and i wanted to stray away from that i want it like even going into it I, before we started drawing anything i was like i want orange tones and blue skies I think that would like you know that would be cool like technical uh oh it's very it. visually um, beautiful like just vibrant yeah and then a lot of, but then a lot of it takes place in a you know in the rain so it's trying to balance that and um something like the barn scene I want uh I wanted to make it so it wasn't just brown so it's mm -hmm. trying to get around that and find that way to convey what you're trying to convey and that just made sense to especially the uh, the second issue of the barn scene it was sort of it makes sense to bathe everything in red and that's like definitely an intentional choice um and it fits thematically through it so it's like yeah trying to find 
uh, a thematic or like story driven reason for it rather than just like what looks nice. Um, but there is also obviously a lot of that as well because you want it to you want it to draw people in, you want it to look nice and uh, and and look good on the page. But it's yeah, trying to find that balance is always yeah. good fun. Oh, for sure. And kind of adding to the emotionalness of it is as you guys tie this whole thing up. Uh, there was the ending was actually surprisingly emotional. Like I didn't expect to feel, I guess, these kind of like almost empathetic emotions when Enfield obviously is is being hung, and then the realization well, that yeah, I was gonna say, and that's not really a spoiler because you start off right away with his corpse. Yeah, so, yes, yeah. and the title of the book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I like to it remind amazing people. how many people were shocked by <laughs> we, the, we, uh, we did an interview. Dead? Well, it is called the mask. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we did an interview with the uh, comicbook.com. Um, this guy Adam Barnhart, um, and uh, one of his questions was about, you know, do, was there any hope at any point, or did you always plan on killing him? And I was like, well, it was in the title. <laughs> <laughs> it's been there all along. You're not, we should, you know, you start off with his corpse, you know, being, yeah. you know, prancing. We should around. have called it. He dies at the end. That would have been. That would have been. Die, like you just point. mentioned, they parade his corpse around. Like, yeah, that's bad. That's that's metal, man. Yeah. Well, I just, <laughs> just wanted to know. Let anybody who hasn't read it know that that wasn't. That's not a spoiler. You're introduced with that immediately. Yeah. It's it's how it all goes down. That that's incredibly yeah. interesting. And what goes down yeah. after he dies. Yeah. Yeah. So it. it it be, it was very much the sort of so we I felt like we knew what was going to happen so it's just like okay how do we get there and how does it end up happening you know like we know that he's going to die and we know it's going to be a result or at least like we imply it's going to be a result of the massacre which is like how does that happen um, and I kind of wrestled with that myself is that I knew that I kind of wanted to do um, take a kind of big swing narratively um, with the final issue. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like, um, what Jake was talking about with, um, you know, with, uh, you know, just having, you know, the, the violence, but have the violence be, um, emotional, have it, you know, have it be not just to have violence for violence sake. Um, I really wanted to push that, the, 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 your sympathy towards the characters and, and, of, you know, feeling empathetic towards them and their and their plight, um, you know, and I really wanted to push that and kind of, you know, give you some, <laughs> just like as a storytelling uh, uh, tool, just to to give you some some hope, and then to to have that be, you know, hammered in. Oh no, this is this is not going well, and so you know, that's where where the violence came in. Um, and I do think that, you know, Texas is a very violent place also. So that's, a, you know, a lot of history of violence. So this is not, you know, something that is outside of the norm. This is very normal for Texas. Yes. Especially um, in those days. Uh, yeah. Especially in those days. But um, so it, it, it just felt like it was necessary to do. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that you had an emotional reaction to it. And a lot of people have said that they've had emotional reactions to it. Well, you guys uh, kind of set it up too, though, to kind of because there is a point where you're almost like, well, did, they didn't. The... Yeah, you're rooting for them because it's like, well, no, they didn't commit the the crime that they're kind of accused of, and there's like some confusion going on, and then of course you've got like this real asshole, you know, bullish sheriff coming in, kind of setting the stage and so there is a point where you're rooting for these guys and there's that very kind of almost heroic scene where they've got like the gatling gun they're they're taking one for the team out there you know there's a big shootout outside that barn and uh so it's it's hard not to root for the guys it almost comes naturally and i think that's a testament to what you guys did yeah well thank you i appreciate it i mean it's just it's uh it's just a matter of trying to figure out how to how to make these characters feel real and and relatable even though it's set 200 years in the past. And also we're only going to see these characters for six issues. Right. And, and so you have to tell a full story in six issues. And, you know, if, if you're trying to make it an, an emotional story in those six issues, and then we also literally, have, like I said before, three panel pages and splash pages. So we have very little real estate to actually 
invest you in these characters and and the fact that we were able to do that i think just sort of i don't know it just it means that it worked you know but i it i i was convinced that i i had screwed up but i i you know luckily had jake to help me uh help elevate me (laughs) like i was floundering but um i just i i do i did feel like there there is definitely things that i'm proud of in this series and looking back on it now i'm very proud of it um but as it was as i was writing and i was just i felt hampered by the the constraints and was worried that it wasn't going to feel the way that i wanted it to feel but luckily i have somebody like jake who is so good at just what i what i like to refer to as the acting um, in the panels, and just he's able to get these characters to feel real, and and to, and to get the action to feel, you know, immediate and and intense. Um, you know, it really helped elevate whatever I had written and, and brought it to its where it needed to be. I don't know. Right. Um, so. Well, and having those pages at the end with the news article and then the interviews and, and all that, that was such a creative way to tell more of the story and give background and, and almost create more emotion to those characters. Cause again, mm-hmm. yeah, we watched something from 1800 years ago and we're like, whatever, they'd all be dead now anyways. And like you still, it, I feel like it takes a little extra step to humanize those characters and make people mm-hmm. remember these were real people with real lives. And like back then, like you had to do what you had to do to survive. Um, so with this being a Western themed comic, did you guys have any westerns tv shows or movies that kind of inspired you or that you loved growing up that kind of made you want to write a western um i definitely did i'd like to hear what jake has to say because he's also <laughs> not from America, i was wondering so. that as well yeah um, yeah because like, yeah, i don't think i really grew up watching them particularly um you know like my parents aren't particularly into westerns but you know, I watched Butch, Butch Cassidy as a kid, and mm-hmm. I, you know, I revisited that. I was, you know, I've seen that many times before, but like, I revisited that whilst I was. I think I sat inking whilst I watched it, like on the, like, um, oh, and cool. you know, I, I revisited the the Dollars trilogy and stuff like that. Like I was sort of trying to, you know, evoke that kind of classic Western. I didn't want to focus too much on. Sort of like modern takes, like cliches, yeah, yeah, like and just like I wanted it to feel somewhat like dated in the way that it comes across, rather than coming across as like a really modern take on a on a sort of classic story. Um, so I, I, yeah, so I revisited a lot of those kind of things. Um, but then, you know, I, I I took a lot of screen grabs from that kind of thing, and like some of it even made it into the story in the background. Some of the backgrounds are from like the the Dollar Trilogy and stuff like that. Um, but trying not to just do a poor imitation of that, trying to bring something new to it as well. Um, but yeah, like it's. I think I watch a lot of films in general, um, so that always comes into it in some way. I think. I think quite cinematically rather than purely in terms of comic books. So I think, Mm -hmm. you know, it's all ingrained in what I'm doing anyway. And I think you can't escape it when you're working on something like this. Um, Mm -hmm. Even if you try to be like, no, I'm not going to think of any of that stuff. You know, it it all comes in in some way, um, which I think makes it a richer experience for everyone. I think if if you can see things that you... And pick out things that you love out from other things and pull it together. Make your own, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That's a that's an interesting take, yeah. Because you know, for us, it's like we kind of grew up. Like I grew up watching westerns, but then you don't think about it. Like you, yeah, you kind of have to search them out more. So being from you know the UK and things like that, we don't. Those are things we don't think about. And then especially, I like seeing. It's almost the outside perspective of the whole Westerns and everything like that. And I thought you did a really great job, you know, again, with the art, uh, it's one of the just absolutely stunning comic yeah. books that I've, I've read, especially in the last year, just visually. Thank you. And Chris, what, which, which ones did, uh, did you look to for inspiration? I mean, definitely Butch Cassidy. That was definitely an inspiration. Cause I love that movie. It was one of the first 
westerns that I can remember watching and loving when I was a kid. Um, and I, one of the ones that really kind of stuck with me was My Darling Clementine, which is a John Ford western. Um, and the, one of the, that's the, it's a, I mean, it, it ended up finding its way into the, into our story where I ended up using my darling Clementine, the song, but actually used the, so like the, the, the lyrics that we know actually originated somewhere around like 1890 or something or like 1885. So it actually, if we were going to use it, we had to use this earlier version of it, which we did. Um, and that's why it's this, these weird lyrics. And it's just, it's just that this is how it predates, um, the, the song, but I wanted to include that because I just, I, I just felt like there was something in that song that was sort of sad and, and could be a little creepy too. Um, I mean, it's a song about a guy whose, whose wife is dead. <laughs> and uh he's lamenting the loss but it, it you know anyway it's just it's a it's a it's like a sort of as a thing that i wanted to include so there was that and i mean i i was i reread a richard matheson western called journal of the gun years and i, I just kind of dabbled here and there and read a bunch of stuff i the sergio toby stuff that i mentioned before reread that and um you know, there's just so, there's so much. I the, all the great John Ford westerns I was watching, and um, I'm trying to remember if there was anything specifically from like the '70s or anything that I was watching. But there, there's just there was oh, uh, the man who shot Liberty Valance. Oh man, that's a one I haven't seen in a long time. Oh man, yeah. and so that kind of played into the whole like the rewriting of history thing as well was that and. Um, yeah, the Wild Bunch is another Sam Peckinpah that um, the sort of the the violence of that was something that um, I wanted to work in into the the book as well. So there was a there's a whole bunch of influences, um, and not just from you know westerns. There was a lot of other stuff too that wound up coming into the into the book. Um, but yeah, I just, I also, I just, to do the wraparound the way that we wanted to do it, I just so, always kind of was fascinated with like Buffalo Bills, um, you know, traveling Western circus. Um, I was always kind of fascinated with that idea and, and the idea that they, you know, they did this to Jesse James or they put him in like a yeah. car and they took pictures with them and you could, you know, so pay crazy. a dime or whatever to take a picture. Um, so we just kind of transposed that and made it into Enfield and made up the thing about like if you look into his eyes, like you'll see the great <laughs> death or something. Um, which seems like something <laughs> that they would have said. Um, but yeah, is there's a whole bunch of influences, just like real life stuff, and you know, there's a lot of stuff that I had read. There was a Texas Rangers podcast on Texas Monthly. Um and I just, I also read Texas Monthly, so that's another thing. So I, there's just a whole bunch of stuff. I don't know. Everything just comes together and it's sort of, you just throw everything. Like melds together, yeah. Well, I think that makes a lot of sense. And uh, one last question that we kind of have too is, I know there was kind of talk about a song there. Um, there's actually a QR code that leads to a Spotify playlist. Yeah. Um, how did you guys pick the songs for this playlist? Um, I think Jake... I actually had a few songs that he wanted to put on this one too. I have that Johnny Cash song. Yeah. But that, I think the rest of it was all you, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and the Texas Blood QR codes for the playlist, I mean, I those were generally just, I would put together songs that were sort of influences into in my writing, but also that I thought would help ampl amplify whatever this the, we were saying in the story. Um, and I like the idea of it's not one per issue, it's just one for the series. And it kind of, as you read and progress in the story, it, it, you're, the, the way that the songs hit you might change. Um, if you mm -hmm. want to do that, it's there. If you don't want to, it's fine too. But that's, that's <laughs> how I came from it. I came to it was, you know, trying to pick songs that I thought were analogous to what was happening in the comic and, and sort of set a mood. Um, then Jake's editions as well also 
did the same thing, sort of had that, that mood setting quality to them. Um, and just, yeah, sort of, you just have, you know, you have songs that sort, sort of evoke like a duel, and then you also have sort, sort of like somber songs that evoke just, you know, mm -hmm. a more emotional, right. you know, quiet scene and things like that. So I just try to do that. I, I, I feel like that adds an element to the comic, to the story, to the experience of reading the comic. Because I've always loved, one of the things that I loved about comics is that there's a, you know, it's a, it's a very personal experience because you're not just sitting and watching a movie where it's like you're, everything's happening at you, but you actually have to interact with it. Um, and, you know, that kind of came out of my love of uh, the Matt Kent series, Mind Management, um, where you have notes in the margins and um, in the gutters of the comic. And uh, so I always loved that and how I got immersed into the world of the comic that way. So I always wanted to do that with the with the playlist and, and with the back matter and just really draw people into the story and make them be, feel involved in the story and be emotionally invested in the story and beyond. You know, hopefully people like songs on the playlist and they might add that to their own playlist, to their own you know, rotation, as it were. Um, but yeah. I love that. I always love when, like the music and the comic and all that stuff, because like, there's always inspirations. We always draw from inspirations, and it doesn't always have to be movies. And so there's also a chance to be like, hey, here's our favorite songs, for example, and this what inspired this, and it's always something unique. And I'm a playlist guy. I go back to the days of burning CDs all the time. Um, <laughs> it's something I always do. Now it's a Spotify playlist. So to me, I always love like not music. as cool, but it's still pretty good. <laughs> it is. It's like it's not as cool because you don't it's get to like less. open up, and it's it does skip a lot yeah. less. Uh, but you know, I can't just, I can't just hand my, my Spotify playlist over to like my wife or something but like, here you go today. Happy Valentine's day. It doesn't you mean the same. Do you need to print QR codes for it and like do it. As that's, a, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Case. You are. Yeah. QR codes are the future. I'm glad they're coming back too. Cause I feel like it leads to exciting things. You can put them in a comic and you get to scan it and be like, Oh dude, this yeah. playlist. And you're finding um, Yeah. Like adding things like that to the book is like, you want to sort of pack the, 30 pages with as much stuff as possible, you know. Like yeah. we've got, we have the pinups, we've got the back matter, we've got the letters pages, the main story, um, any sort of like design stuff, like even like down to the the inside front cover was like designed off like a you know, like a catalog from the time with oh, the, yeah. with all the indicia stuff on it and stuff like that and um even the price and so originally I was thinking oh I'll get like I'll find some funny real uh, examples of stuff they would have in these catalogs and they would change it every month but due to time restrictions they end up just keeping it the same one but like even stuff like that is like trying to bring people in as much as possible yeah uh, and create so, a and, world and, and also, yeah and create a world and give people a reason to stick around or pick them in the first place. it's immersive you know yeah. people feel like they're a part like you guys said is they're a part of what you guys are doing and it kind of is a way for them to connect more with what you guys are doing and uh yeah it's a really Especially good idea. When there's, you know, there's so many comics that come out every week that you need yeah. a reason to, to pick up our one, I guess. And even, yeah, like with the with the trade, we've got the um, an extra six pages of story um, in the back. So it's like, a, again, a reason to go out and pick it up um, either again or just for the first time. But it's, you know, trying to give people, you know, a reason to actually go and get it and... Um, and give them as much stuff as we possibly can. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the design of the book is really beautiful as well. And that's one of the things that I kind of love about what Jake did with it. And like it, he, he said before that he used some of the photos that he took when we were in Texas for that. And it's just that even that I feel like is an immersive thing that, you know, it brings you into it's not just, you know, his pencil drawings. And, you, you know, you're also seeing, you know, Texas Actual as he sees it, like literally. Um, and the um, the paper stock as well that we use was intentionally, um, you know, using using newsprint was an intentional choice, again to just add to, to the the whole vibe of the book and make it as immersive as possible. Yeah. Is the trade be, pack? Yeah, yeah, that's going to be in the same paper as well. Which is pretty rare. I don't think that they often never, do yeah. trades in no. newsprint. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, that's a conversation that we we usually have before. That's really where, you know, I I think that our sort of discussions about things really 
start and, and, yeah. and what we we really think a lot about, you know, for example, when we were doing Enfield and we were talking about, okay, we'll, we'll do three panel pages, we'll do splash pages, we'll do, we'll do this, you know, the back matter, the way we're going to do the back, we're going to do newsprint and the way that we kind of think about that stuff. And we even thought about how, how we're branding it. Um, Texas Blood, should we have the Texas Blood logo on it? Should we not? You know, how do we include it? Like that's, that's really where, you know, our discussions in, in terms of what where we were just like, where we meet and we'll talk about stuff. Yeah. That's what we talk about. Um, we don't necessarily talk about, you know, story or anything like that. What we talk about is the, the little fine details of things, mm -hmm. uh, which I think are very important. And I think that, you know, it's, it's one of the things that maybe sets us apart um, is that we really do spend a lot of time just thinking about, you know, how are we going to package this? Because yeah. I think the packaging is as much a part of it as, as the story. I mean, we, we definitely care about the story and, you know, we spend a lot of time in the story and how we, we tell it. Um, but we also want to make it a, a unique, immersive, interesting package for you as, as a reader picking it up. Because, you know, personally, I came from just being a reader. So I definitely I'm aware of what works for me and what I want to have. Oh, same. Um, so I, I know what kind of experience I would enjoy. And so if I'm able to do something, you know, if we're able to do something together, that's something that I think that I might actually enjoy as just a reader. I think that that, you know, goes a long way. I think the more we do it, the more I notice it or, the, or even the lack of it in other books that I read, it's mm. like, you know, I can be loving the story, but if the design's off, you know, there's loads of beautifully designed books for this. Um, if something's off, you're like, oh, I wish they hadn't put it on this really shiny paper or, yeah. you know, stuff like that. And it's like, because even though the, like, I'm dreading that the trade's going to be too thin because it's on this paper, but it's 200 pages long, so I think it'll be fine. But it's just like things like that. It's like um, you have to sort of balance that and like think, it, you know when it shows up is it going to be a substantial object because that's part of it as well is like you know you don't you, you're paying you know 16 or whatever for this book and you want it to be a substantial thing you know for yeah. people to part with their money especially when people are getting more and more into manga where you can spend you know much less on much more so you're like you need it to be something worth owning i think oh absolutely i think and then that's that's a good thing too like chris said you know he came from being a reader a fan and uh, that plays a lot into it. And like you said, we're very aware of what we want in our hands and what's going to work for us. And hopefully that translates out. And it's, that's something really good to be self-aware of. And uh, yeah. I know I'm going to be buying the trade. I know Lauren is. Final order cutoff is March 4th for the trade. And April 9th is when the, uh, the trade is going to be hitting the stands. So yeah. what are some of the final thoughts you guys have? What is the, the last thing you have to say about the Enfield gang before we wrap up here? Well... One thing that the the new six page story taught us is that maybe there's more to do with this this gang, um, and it, you know just because the story ended in in the Enfield Gang Massacre, there's, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's not more Western story to tell. Um, so that's definitely something that we can pull that thread if we want to and, and do, and if and if there's interest in it, we'll we'll definitely pursue that. So that's that's kind of one of the things, but I'm also just really honored by the, the reaction that it's had. Um, you know, we were on a number of year end lists and that means a lot, but it's also just the, the, the notes we get from readers means a lot to me, especially when, you know, it's about them, you know, reacting emotionally to certain yeah. scenes or certain characters or storyline in general. Jake, what about you? Yeah. I mean, basically just to echo what, Chris said, I think, yeah, when we get these emails off readers, it's just the, you know, it's the best thing because you, you, we spend a lot of time sat in our rooms by ourselves. You know, me and Chris live halfway across the world from each other. Yeah. And so, we, you know, we're very much just in there by yourself creating it every day and you have no idea. You know, I'm sending these pages off. I've got no idea if anyone's going to even look at them, let alone like them. So, yeah, the, the response that we've had has just been great and hopefully it continues in the in the trade hopefully people like what we're doing and people like the new story as well and um yeah hopefully we get some new readers in to that and hopefully that leads to people discovering texas blood if they haven't already read that and 
yeah, hopefully people are along for the ride. Yeah, absolutely. You guys have done something amazing. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I know I did myself. I know Lauren did. We are we we're chatting about it. I've been raving about it uh, for the past, you know, six months or so. And so people make sure you guys pick this up. Uh, and then last thing is where can people find more of your work? Where can they find you, whether it's social media, whether it's anywhere out there in the world? Uh, we have a Patreon um, together where we post all sorts of things. Chris does a podcast every month and uh, we do um, newsletters and behind the scenes stuff, sketches. We do postcards every month. Chris writes letters to people, all sorts of stuff. Um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter as well. Uh, mm, that Jacob Phillips, I think it is. Good news, everybody. <laughs> it's actually going to be in the notes of the show, so you can also look in oh, the notes of the show there or just search the thing. Yes. Okay, look, look, look in there for the uh, for my Instagram handle. But yeah, I'm on. You know, we're posting all the time. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, I'm on. I'm not on Instagram uh, at the moment. Um, I'm trying to wean myself off of social media, although I understand that it's uh, integral. It's that necessary it. evil sometimes. Yeah. Like oh, it's exhausting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I also just I have that sort of addictive personality where I find myself like on that. That's why I got rid of Instagram was that I found myself on it for like an hour and a half one day. And I was like, what happened to that time? <laughs> <laughs> um, you fell anyway, down a hole. I, I am on Twitter um and blue sky although i don't really check blue i don't sky too much I'm, but i, I we have blue sky too and i'm never yeah um at christoph condon it's christopher without the er um, um that's the same handle on both um and yeah the patreon and uh, matt i wanted to thank you for your great uh, reviews um, oh, thank you yeah for a joy to read um and yeah, it was, this was a fun talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for thank you for doing this. And thanks for yeah, thank you for having us on. Oh, no, for having us. And seriously, and like those things. So, anytime you guys want to come through and chat about anything you're doing, uh, you're more than welcome back here. We uh, we're not going anywhere. And uh, feel free, swing on through. We love what you guys are doing out there. You're doing some really amazing work. People, make sure you pick up this comic book. Trust me, you will not be disappointed. Um, and like I said, man, I'm starting to think like this. This could be the start of like some westerns making a comeback um especially I think, I, time. Think I, had, I think it might be i hope so it was a lot of fun lauren any final thoughts no i just yeah matt was raving about it for a while i read the all six issues last week and yeah i instantly fell in love with it and it took me by surprise man that ending it did that uh was, it was a very unique ending and it was really surprised me and i, I genuinely loved it so and i don't want to say what it is because everyone else should go read it yes go read it <laughs> It is very emotional. It is a very great comic book. It's coming out April 9th is where you can pick up the trade. Or if you just want to pick up all six issues, guess what? It's out there in the comic world right now. Uh, do that. Pick it up. Read it wherever you buy your comic books from, whether it's digitally, whether it's in a comic book store. Uh, me personally, I like to have the physical copy in hand. So, you know, I'm at my local comic book shop. It is also new comic book day today. So get on over there while you're picking up your new weekly DC, Marvel, whatever it is, comics. Grab the Enfield Gang Massacre out now thanks again guys we will be chatting to you guys soon and everybody else we see you guys next week and cheers thank you thank you bye